Hey guys, so yes, this is another Vegan Gains video. He did make a part two to the first Kal-El video. Uh, this one was not taken down for bullying. Um, if you've seen it, it's not anything like the first one in terms of the level of uh, vitriol. But unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation here, and I don't know if that's intentional or not. I think Richard just hasn't looked into uh, reduced terrianism, reduced satarianism, however the hell you say it. I think he just hasn't looked into it and what it actually means because he doesn't care. You know, as he made clear in this video, in the last video, in almost every video he's made, I guess, uh, you're either vegan or you're scum, right? Like there's no in between for him. You know, if you are like Kal-El, vegan most of the time and eating, you know, a few candy bars a year using perfume that isn't cruelty free, whatever. Um, but again, otherwise mostly vegan, it doesn't matter to him. You might as well be like a typical omnivore. It doesn't surprise me that he wouldn't even take just a few minutes to Google <laughs> reducetarianism and to figure out like what exactly it is and what it um, kind of stands for. So anyway, let's get to it. Rather than taking an abolitionist approach to animal activism, she's uh, adopted a reducetarianism approach. So now it's not that uh, she's claiming it's wrong to cause suffering and death to animals. She's saying, it's okay to do it sometimes. So long as you're reducing suffering, that's good enough. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is not what reducetarianism is. So it just means reduction. That That's literally it. Like there's no underlying philosophy behind it. Um, in fact, it's explicitly motivation neutral. It is composed of individuals who are committed to eating less meat, red meat, poultry, and seafood, as well as less dairy and fewer eggs, regardless of the degree or motivation. This concept is appealing because not every Everyone is willing to follow an all or nothing diet. And they're also explicitly not anti-vegan. It's inclusive of vegans. However, reducetarianism is still inclusive of vegans, vegetarians, and anyone else who reduces the amount of animal products in their diet. Now, in practice, it does seem that most or at least a large majority of reducetarians do recognize the inherent uh, problems, environmental, moral problems with eating meat. And they imagine a future in which animal agriculture is no longer, is a thing of the past. In other words, they want abolition, just like a vegan. Um, they're just taking an incremental approach to it. And I think you can see this pretty clearly if you look at uh, like quotes from supporters of the reducetarian movement. There's repeated mention of elimination as the ideal um, and only like four or five quotes out of over 60 imply that they don't want complete elimination. Um, only two are stronger statements like mentioning that they love meat or they have no plans to go vegetarian. A couple talk about um, only about like factory farming and ending factory farming. And one is a little too like emphatic about moderation in all things. But those are not the typical comments. Most of the comments are at least hinting at, if not just explicitly uh, saying that they want this, you know, incremental change to lead to a much larger change. I'm a big fan of the reducetarian movement. Our brains get spooked by sudden change, but small, subtle changes can sneak past our change detectors. Reducetarians are basically change ninjas. And to be clear, there is actually some evidence uh, for this approach. The Animal Welfare Action Lab did a study very recently in which people were exposed to a reducetarian uh, message or an elimination style message. So like, you know, uh, reduce meat versus go vegan. And receiving either type of article didn't seem to matter in terms of reduction. Um, both groups reduced consumption by about the same amount. They also changed attitudes in the same ways, um, being more likely to agree that buying animal products contributes to animal suffering, uh, agreeing that animals are not treated well and that animal agriculture is bad for the environment, etc. In other words, regardless of a reduced Tyrion message and elimination message, people took home basically the same advice and responded in pretty much the same way. And other studies have had similar results, in some cases finding that a, you know, reduce your meat or cut out meat um, type of message was more effective than a go vegan message. And this really isn't surprising when we look at other studies, you know, studies in other areas. So they don't have to do with veganism or um, reducing meat consumption or anything like that. They have to do with maybe um, recycling or something. You know, studies that are dealing with kind of lifestyle change and motivation, they often come to the same conclusion. You know, it's this kind of um, baby steps approach, this incremental change that is more appealing to people than like, 
hey, stop driving. Nick Cooney talks about this a lot in this presentation from, I think, several years ago now. So there were some researchers um, in California in the U.S., who went around to homes in a particular neighborhood, and they brought with them these kind of ugly yard signs that said, drive safely. Now, because the yard signs were pretty ugly, when they asked homeowners if they would put up these yard signs out in the front yard, only about 17% of homeowners agreed to and did put out the yard signs. Researchers then went to other homes in the same neighborhood. They knocked on doors, but this time they had little window stickers three inch or five centimeter by five centimeter or so window stickers that also said, please drive safely. Knocked on doors, said, hey, we're promoting safe driving. We wondered if you would put up these stickers. And this time, because it was such an easy thing to do to put that sticker up in your window, virtually everyone agreed to and did put up the stickers. Three weeks later, researchers went back to the same homes that got the stickers. But this time, they brought with them those ugly yard signs. Knocked on doors, said, hey, it's me again. Thanks so much for putting up those stickers. And now I wondered if you would put this yard sign out in your front yard. And this time, not 17%, but almost 70% agreed to and did put the yard signs out in the front yards. Even though the main goal of researchers was to get the yard signs out in the front yard, they were much more effective at doing so by first making a similar but smaller request that people were likely to say yes to, and then later going back and making their second, real, larger request. People who make a small change become more likely to make a larger change down the line. And there's other studies in the US that, and, and Europe as well that have shown this as well. People who have gone, uh, who have reduced their meat consumption, people who have gone vegetarian in surveys, have shown that they are much more interested than the general public to go vegan and more likely to end up going vegan down the line. So all that said, again, the point is that the reducetarian movement is not about saying it's okay to cause a little bit of suffering. That is not the point. It doesn't seem to be generally what reducetarians believe. And again, reducetarian includes vegan. The point is more to acknowledge that incremental change is important, that a lot of people are more willing to make small changes than they are to just go vegan. And the science is kind of on their side. Because I mean, if you really think about it, the whole point of a vegan movement is to reduce animal suffering. Okay, again, uh, this is following off of her, uh, her bastardized version of veganism. The point of veganism isn't to reduce animal suffering, it is to abolish the animal agriculture industry, to remove all unnecessary forms of animal exploitation, suffering, and death as much as reasonably possible. If you're talking about, what you're talking about right now is reducitarianism. Reducitarianism, reducitarianism is the idea that you should reduce the amount of uh, suffering and death you cause, not eliminate it. Again, no. And also, vegans do seek to reduce animal suffering. That's correct. Like, we can't eliminate it fully. We seek to reduce it by as much as is possible and practicable. Maybe non-vegan reducetarians find veganism less practicable, um, they're just less motivated to cut out animal products completely, but the point is that they're doing something and it's an ongoing process. Vegans are making a harder push or are maybe just a bit farther along than other reducetarians, but it doesn't mean that the goal is fundamentally different. On a global scale, to the fullest possible extent, yeah. Okay, so now you're talking about reducing animal suffering to the fullest possible extent. Okay, so does buying leather shoes reduce animal suffering to the fullest possible extent? Does buying movie theater popcorn that isn't vegan reduce animal suffering and exploitation and death to the fullest possible extent? What about the candy bars you eat? Do you think that's uh, helping to reduce animal suffering death to the fullest possible extent? So the full quote was, the whole point of the vegan movement is to reduce animal suffering on a global scale to the fullest possible extent, yeah? So this is just a huge disconnect that goes on throughout Richard's video. Um, Kal-El isn't talking about individual you know, personal actions. She's not saying that buying leather shoes is better than buying non-leather shoes. The whole point of her video essentially is what she just said, you know, reducing animal suffering on a global scale, which means looking beyond our own personal actions and really thinking critically about the best way that we can inspire change in others, which is really something that we should all be doing, seeing as we're kind of terrible, like we're really shit at convincing people to go vegan or even just 
trying to get them to stay vegan. Also, it's entirely possible that someone like Kellel, who is mostly vegan, reduced herian, however you want to, you know, uh, define it, I guess, someone who isn't fully vegan, that she might actually be better at convincing people to eat less animal products simply because she isn't fully vegan. So someone might say something like, oh, you know, she isn't an extremist. She's willing to admit that she's not perfect. She seems more reasonable. I'm going to listen to her. Of course, it's also possible that someone might view Kal-El, you know, someone who's eating a tiny amount of animal products as like inconsistent and maybe even a hypocrite. So they may brush off, um, you know, any thing they have to say about veganism, about animal advocacy. We really don't know. Like, this is total speculation on my part. Um, if I were to guess, I would guess that it probably doesn't really matter if we're talking about, like, the advocate themselves. Kind of like the study I mentioned earlier, both a vegan and, like, mostly vegan, reducetarian, you know, wh whatever, 99% vegan, whatever you want to call them, um, I think would likely have similar results. I think what probably matters the most is coming across like a normal person, like someone who isn't misanthropic and dogmatic and like really angry. Like, I don't know. I think we can all think of really good examples, just relatable people. Lauren Toyota, uh, Rose from Cheap Lazy Vegan, uh, Anthony Fantano, the vegan vloggers that Richard just disparages because I guess he personally finds their content boring. What I eat in a day, vegan vlogs. Um, vegan makeup, vegan grocery hauls, you know, just typical vegan vlogger crap that you see on YouTube. <laughs> Basically, the opposite of Richard is what I'm saying. If you're going to make these absolutist claims that this method of animal activism promoting reducitarianism is more effective than uh, promoting animal abolition, then do you have any facts or figures to support this? Interesting coming from somebody who doesn't seem interested at all in actually looking into the Reducetarian movement, actually looking into the evidence behind the Reducetarian movement. And also, it's really weird that he's, I don't know, calling out Kal-El for making absolutist claims when her entire video is full of like qualifiers saying that I think this, I personally think this. However, I personally disagree with that strategy. I personally think that people use labels to define their choices. I think the majority of people find the vegan label to be too much to take on because of how we've branded it. I think having a transitioning label for those who are making real strides towards veganism and putting in the effort to minimize their impact will have a huge effect on sales of vegan food and vegan products. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. At least Kalel, myself, Tobias, a vegan strategist, JC Reese, tons of other activists, at least we care. We care enough to take the time to actually think about the effectiveness of our advocacy, of the strategies that we use. Richard just does not seem to care at all. He clearly cares about the vegan label, he clearly cares about calling people out when they fall short of it, but he doesn't seem to care about how what he's doing affects others and whether or not it's the best way to reach people. I wonder why. Could it be that if he actually acknowledged the research that we have on human psychology, on vegan outreach, that he would then also have to acknowledge that his anyone who isn't vegan is scum kind of brand of activism is not supported by the research? Just a guess. And uh, this doesn't make any logical sense. How is saying it's okay to cause uh, suffering and death sometimes going to lead to the abolishment of animal agriculture, whereas saying it's never okay to support suffering and death, that's not going to lead to the abolishment of animal agriculture? Again, reducetarian does not mean that it's okay to cause like a little bit of animal suffering, animal death. Also, this doesn't have to do with deductive logic. It has to do with empirical facts of human psychology. And I don't know if you know this, but humans, not always rational. Who is right or who is wrong here, it's not gonna be settled by a syllogism. It's gonna be settled by evidence. Yes, it is possible, if not probable, that reduced terrianism could appeal better to humans, to human psychology, and achieve change faster than veganism. We need to realize that when we are encouraging dietary change, we are interacting with human beings, and that means we have to account for human psychology. We need to craft our messaging in a way that accepts how people's brains actually work, not how we think they should work. 
Right now, the best data from both inside and outside the animal protection movement suggests that using language other than vegan in our advocacy work is likely to spare more animals from misery and to create more vegans, although that's a side point. And then they go into the evidence. This was written, I think, uh, in like 2016, so it's a couple years old, so they don't have the um, animal welfare study, or I think Phonolytics has done one too, so those aren't mentioned. But uh, yeah, it's worth a read. And I think it's also important to note here, and I think I've said this before, if you look at the vegan organizations, the ones that are the most prominent, the ones that are often featured by like animal uh, charity evaluators, so Mercy for Animals, Humane League, um, Animal Equality, Good Food Institute, none of them, not a single one are using tactics like Richard. <laughs> not a single one are shaming people or trying to make people feel bad or trying to make people feel like your scum if you aren't fully vegan. And I think this is important because we are, again, dealing with an area of research that is in its infancy. We don't have a lot of stuff specifically on veganism, specifically on reducing animal products. So it is important to look at these large organizations that are spending money. They obviously care whether or not their strategy is effective. I think we should care that the strategies that they are using are rather similar and they are not motivated by anger and hatred and wanting to have the moral high ground, you know, that's what comes across to me when I watch one of Richard's videos. That's not what comes across to me when I read a tweet from Mercy for Animals. And I'm not saying Mercy for Animals is perfect. I've criticized them time and time again for some of their um, bullshit health claims, certain claims about protein, certain things about like, uh, was one recently about something like, look at all these uh, vegan celebrities. They found the fountain of youth and it's veganism. It was some bullshit like that. You know, I, I really don't like that, that sort of thing. And Mercy for Animals does that quite frequently. Yeah, so they're not perfect, but in terms of their attitudes, in terms of ultimately what they're going for, they're going for positivity. They're going for education without uh, shaming. But anyway, back to Kal-El. So she did make, um, I think, two very compelling points beyond just her like, you know, I think this, I think this, um, and also dealing with human psychology. I want to give you two examples for how this transition label could really make a difference. Many people try to go vegan, get overwhelmed, make mistakes, get called out, feel like a failure, and then often resent other vegans and just say fuck it and revert back into their old diet. Humans use labels as frame work for many of their daily choices. So this choice to just fully go back to their old diet is a major, major missed opportunity. If those people never set the bar to be full vegan, and instead they had some kind of transition label, they likely never would have felt a sense of failure for not meeting up to the world's expectations of that label. In other words, they would likely still be on a mostly vegan diet doing their best to minimize impact instead of just throwing the towel in. People are so worried about being called out for their mistakes or for not quite being vegan enough that so many people aren't even willing to tell anyone about their strides towards veganism. And again, this is a major missed opportunity. Promotion of efforts and spreading the message is vital to the movement. So if people aren't doing it, that sucks. This situation that's happening with me right now, what message do you think that is sending to other people who maybe have been on the fence about admitting to the world that they're going vegan? I would be very interested in seeing Richard actually address these points. I just don't, I don't think he's made it clear with this video and others that he's just not in a headspace to do that. He will not, he cannot think about veganism on a global scale, as kal -El says. He, he just will not think about it beyond his own personal actions and other people's own personal actions and just labeling people vegan or not. And again, if he did that, he would have to make a lot of changes to his channel and I think to his person, right? Um, he would have to really work on not being so angry. And that's hard. And it's obviously something that I don't think we should expect from him at this point. I'm not saying he's a lost cause or anything. I don't think anyone is. I believe in second, third, fourth, fifth chances. Uh, but I think at this point, I'm not holding my breath. His only responses to this, to kind of vegans making veganism unappealing is number one, like, nah, -uh, you do. <laughs> like that's, wow, okay, great argument. And it just totally misses her point. And then the second thing is using like the justice system as an analogy. Okay, so uh, again, you're talking about flexibility 
uh, within the definition of veganism. So we should have a uh, tolerance range for cruelty. Um, do you believe we should have that in the legal system? Is Should there be a tolerance range for murder? Well, you know, he only murdered one person, and, you know, he, he lived 20 years without murdering anyone, but, you know, it's, it's just this one person. Um, yeah, let's just let that one slide. Should there be a tolerance range in our legal system for crime? Yes, and in fact, that tolerance already exists in the legal system. The reason that we have trials in the first place, the reason we don't just sentence, oh, you murdered someone? Okay, jail for you for X number of years. This is the same exact sentencing that every single person who has ever murdered anyone gets. Of course, that's not how it works. There's a big difference between someone who is a repeat offender, I mean, on my mind right now because it's relevant, the Golden State Killer, versus someone who, you know, we can imagine some sort of extraordinary um, circumstance, uh, someone who is obviously very remorseful, they're not likely to offend again, you know, they have a, a low uh, chance of recidivism, those two people are not the same. The point is that not every case should receive the same treatment. So ultimately what Richard is advocating for is like zero tolerance policy. Um, now, to be clear, I don't think he's actually advocating for that. I don't think he's really thought about it beyond murder is bad. He's just trying to make an analogy and he hasn't really thought it through. But zero tolerance, whether it's in schools, workplaces, always terrible. Not only are they without good evidence, but they may actually encourage um, more harm because it encourages someone to just go all out and maybe do cause more harm than they would have otherwise because it doesn't matter at that point. The consequences are the same. So yeah, it's a really bad analogy. It's not how the legal system works. Zero tolerance policy has been criticized by numerous people for being just terrible. And there's no reason to think that shunning vegans for mistakes and kicking them out of the club is any more effective. People need to feel applauded for all of their efforts. They can't go into this feeling like everything is just pointing out how they could be doing better. Okay, um, like, name a real life situation. Like, we're not talking about on YouTube. Do you honestly think that, like, if you have a vegan friend and, uh, you know, he convinces one of his friends to, you know, adopt a vegan or plant-based diet, and uh, his friend says, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get onto this vegan thing. I, I cut out cheese uh, out of my diet. I cut out dairy. I cut out eggs. Now I just have to uh, get rid of, like, chicken and some fish out of my diet, then I'll be fully vegan. Uh, do you, have you ever seen a real-life situation where uh, your vegan friend was like, what are you, a fucking asshole? You're torturing animals and shit, you piece of crap? You can't even go full vegan right away? No, th this doesn't happen in real life. Oh, how convenient. <laughs> how convenient. Yeah, we only want examples from real life, not from online, not from YouTube. I wonder why. Could it be because Richard harassing people on YouTube is a perfect example of making veganism look militant and hostile? So look, there's no doubt that the online world is a harsher environment and that real life friends are going to be less hostile. But the problem is, how likely is it that someone who is going vegan because of some online influencer like Kalel? How likely is it that they are going to have vegan friends in real life? Online community for vegans is huge. A lot of vegans use it for social life, for advice, for support, for venting. The influencers that Kalel was talking about are reaching people online. And so that's where the promotion of veganism and harassment of, you know, people falling short, that's where it comes from. However, I personally think that polarizing someone who is really trying to be vegan by pushing them into the vegetarian label is hurting the movement more than it's helping it. I, I, I don't even understand what the fuck you're trying to say. I think what she's trying to say here is that if someone calls themselves vegan, they're more likely to adopt lifestyle habits that align closer to veganism, where if, as if they identify as vegetarian, they're probably going to make fewer lifestyle changes towards veganism. Uh, again, like that just makes no fucking sense at all. Yes, that is what she's saying. And it actually does make perfect sense if you look at psychology. Labels are a huge deal and they absolutely influence behavior. And this is like not controversial. I, I don't know why Richard can't wrap his head around it. I think it's because, again, he would have to change so much of what he is doing. He is so intent on 
being upset with people who aren't vegan and not wanting someone who is not fully vegan to call themselves vegan, either because it just feels really wrong to him or because it's like a like a fair thing, right? It's like not fair that someone who isn't as vegan as he is, is calling themselves vegan. I don't know. Um, but the point is going back to labels. And if we're looking specifically at vegetarian and vegan, you know, vegetarians can consume milk without really thinking much about it, without really paying much attention to it, because it's not causing any cognitive dissonance. They aren't labeling themselves as vegan, they're labeling themselves as vegetarian, and milk is totally okay on a vegetarian diet. Drinking milk is not in conflict with their personal identity. There's good reason to believe that somebody who identifies as vegan, even if they aren't fully vegan, that they are going to consume fewer animal products than if they were to uh, go back, so to speak, and use a vegetarian label. Because again, now they don't have that cognitive dissonance that's telling them that, uh, you really shouldn't be drinking milk. You really shouldn't be eating eggs. Instead, it's like, oh, I'm vegetarian. I can eat as much of those things as I want. I'm not saying this to hate on vegetarians or anything like that. I think uh, vegetarian is a good transition for a lot of people. And obviously you're still making a big difference. My point again is just that there is good reason to believe that identifying as a vegan is different than identifying as a vegetarian and it can uh, influence our behavior. You know how many criminals claim they've done nothing wrong? Like uh, lying and telling people I've done nothing wrong, it doesn't seem to correlate with less crime. It, claiming that you're vegan doesn't seem to correlate with causing less animal suffering since you still buy movie theater popcorn candy bars, buy leather shoes. It's not about lying. It's not about lying to others. It's about being true to yourself and to your own identity. And if, you know, if pressure from others forces you to change your identity, that can affect your behavior. The idea of having a label that people actually want to identify with, that, um, you know, accurately reflects their goals, reflects their ideology, that's great. And, you know, plant-based just does not cut it for a lot of people. I think Kal-El made a really good choice by talking about reduced terrianism and ultimately promoting it. I think this is one that will speak to a lot more people. I think it may be one that people um, kind of trend to, either on the way to vegan, or even just beyond. You know, I can totally see people who are vegan but still identify as reduced -tarian. I've heard from, I would say, 10 people, maybe more, over the years that I've been doing this who have said that, like, they are vegan but they don't identify as vegan because they don't like vegans. <laughs> because such a large, uh, seemingly large number of vegans are like not the nicest people. I can totally see someone like that instead identifying as reducitarian. Reducitarian. <laughs> reduced tarian. Whatever you identify as, I don't really think it matters. I, I went into this a little bit in the last video and a little bit on Twitter as well. I think what matters is how we are treating other people and really making sure that we're not misrepresenting other people and other movements and we're not slandering other movements like, like some people are doing, especially when those movements are just trying to make the world a better place. You know, vegans really don't like when people like uh, misrepresent us and straw man us with false definitions and with viewpoints that we don't hold. So hopefully again, this is just Richard being unfamiliar and not like intentionally straw manning. I really think it is the former. As I said at the beginning, I think he just doesn't care because if you're not vegan, it doesn't like it doesn't matter to him. You're not vegan, so fuck off, which sucks, but you know, what can you do? Anyway, thank you so much for watching, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope more vegans will start to recognize that we're not convincing very many people to go vegan. <laughs> we're obviously very bad at this. And maybe, maybe we should stop going after people and start allying with people, even though they aren't fully vegan, right? Like start allying with vegetarians. Oh my God. You know, start allying with reduced -tarianism. God, Jesus, reduced Aryans, um, you know, people who are reducing animal suffering and they obviously care about the same things that we care about. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Comments and questions down below. Support the channel, patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan. And I will have a new video very soon.